So up to this point, we've gone over the different components in a distribution circuit, especially those that cause voltage drop like transformers, overhead lines and underground cables. And what we're gonna talk about next is what type of voltage drop we would typically see like in distribution circuits and then how we're going to compensate for that if the voltage gets too low. And so in this lecture, we'll, we'll get into this topic we call voltage regulation and how we can do some basic um, voltage drop analysis using k-factors. So I'm not sure if, if uh, any of you in the class have ever bothered to measure your wall voltage before. Um, basically, we, we talked about the, the fact that residential households would, would all have like transformers that step the voltage down from primary to secondary. And this was an example that I showed in a previous class uh, on this pad mount transformer. And you'll notice here that what this is doing, it's converting this to a dual voltage 240-120 source where the 240 would maybe be measurable in uh, like a utility closet where you had a clothes dryer. And then the 120 would correspond to all the various wall sockets, right? And so um, what you could actually do is you could actually measure the, the wall socket voltage. And one way you could do something like this would be to take like a, a handheld meter. Um, you can plug the, the, the test probes into the wall meter socket um, as shown right here. And what you're going to see is you're going to see a voltage on what we would call a 120 volt base. This is why we use 120 volts a lot of times for uh, looking at voltage drop because it's something that customers can relate to. And so uh, I just took a, a measurement um, where I'm recording and saw we had a voltage right here of 124 volts, which is probably a little bit on the high side, but but not you know atypical. You know, a lot of times if you were going to go to different uh, residential sites, you'd probably see voltages more around 122 volts. Ut uh, utilities tend to like to keep it a little bit higher to account for um, drop you might have under like high loading conditions. And as we'll talk about, the idea here is to make sure this voltage stays within the range required for your appliances. So, for example, if we were talking about a computer monitor, um, you know, these are obviously made to pl plug into um, wall outlets, but you'll see on here actually kind of a wide range, 100 to 240 volts, 50 slash 60 hertz. That's because these computer uh, monitors are made for international markets, where if you go to Europe, you'd have a different voltage than if you were going to go to some other country in Asia, let's say. And the, and the frequencies would be different in these other countries as well, right? So as we'll talk about later, the important thing is, is to keep this voltage magnitude within a certain range. And if we can keep this voltage magnitude within a certain range and the various appliance manufacturers and can make sure that when we plug into the wall socket, it's gonna work properly. If I were gonna take a measurement of this voltage at different times of day, this is gonna change as well, depending on what else is happening on the distribution circuit I'm connected up to. And so it doesn't stay fixed at 124. It's constantly fluctuating up and down due to changes going on the circuit as far as like loading. So I'm going to break this lecture into three parts. I'm going to first start off by talking about voltage delivery requirements, uh, what's required from a regulatory standpoint, and what are we be some options for fixing problems that we might see on distribution circuits. And I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about k-factor for doing voltage drop. We're going to use this k-factor quite a bit for voltage drop analysis associated with voltage regulation or also with capacitor placement in a future lecture. Part B, I'm going to get into the mechanics and the construction of what we would call a line voltage regulator. It's, it's, it's an auto transformer type of a connection for the transformer, but it's set up in such a way where we can adjust the, the voltage at certain parts in the distribution circuit. And there's another feature I'll talk about is it's what's called line drop compensation. And then I'll have some examples at the end. We'll show you, I go through like a typical design example where we actually would set up a voltage regulator and show how this would get modeled in, in windmill then. So there are standards in different countries related to voltage. And the standards we would use in the United States are 
from American National Standards Institute, ANSI. Sometimes these are co-listed with, with IEEE, but, but ANSI is the standard that we would use in the United States. And as far as delivery requirements that the utility would need to adhere to, there's two different types of voltages that you need to be able to distinguish. One is the service voltage, and this would be the voltage up to the meter, right? So the utility is responsible for making sure that the voltage up to a meter stays within a certain range. And that range is for residential loads plus minus 5%. And so if normal nominal voltage would be 120, it could get as low as 114, it can only get as high as 126, and that's at the meter socket. Now, once the customer um, is gonna take, I guess, ownership of this service, uh, the customer is responsible for any sort of voltage drop within the household or within a commercial facility or industrial facility. If you were gonna measure the voltage at say like a motor in a, in a industrial location, then that's what's referred to as utilization voltage. So service voltage is up to the meter. Utilization voltage is what the appliance actually sees. And the difference is gonna be what type of drop you have within the customer facilities. So it's up to the customer to make sure that that voltage would then stay within range if the utility is doing its job as far as the service voltage. So the ANSI standards basically would allow for utilization voltage to get as low as 110 or possibly as high as 125 for what we call range A service. And range A service would be normal conditions. And so there's no contingency like due to a ice storm, let's say, the voltage is supposed to stay within this range. Range B is the range associated with emergency conditions. And so if there's um, like a major storm going on, uh, if there's some issues with generation or transmission, then the service voltage could actually vary within a wider range. Um, on a 120 volt uh, basis, this would be between 110 and 127. So that would, the range B corresponds to poor quality conditions, but normally utilities would try to adhere to like a range A. Now you'll note that due to the fact that we have a voltage drop within the customer's location and the voltage can get possibly as low as 110 for like a commercial appliance, um, there's actually some confusion when you look at ratings on the device, um, say like a blender, let's say, you know, sometimes that'll be listed as being for 115 or 110, whatever. Those are all nominal 120 volt ratings. Um, but what they're basically telling you is that, well, this blender to account for the drop within a facility could actually operate as low as 110, right? But in reality, it's, you know, probably going to be more like 120. And the, and the issue would be, and maybe I'll do this in a future lecture if I have a class, the issue would be if this voltage gets too low, then the appliance will not operate correctly. So for example, if you were gonna take um, like a computer monitor and drop the voltage on it, you know, maybe this, the screen um, would start to shrink a little bit or maybe it would just trip offline at a certain point when the voltage got too low. So anyway, What's gonna be important as far as distribution engineering is making sure that customer at the meter sees a range A voltage. So if we're doing planning, if we're like distribution planners and we wanna make sure that we're um, giving our customers the right voltage, then how do we do this? Because as you'll see in just a little bit, if I'm at the substation, I can boost the voltage up to kind of a high value. At the substation, I've got voltage regulation, right? And so I might set that all the way up to maybe like 105% of rated voltage. On a 120 volt basis, if I were gonna connect a residential customer up to that point, that residential customer with 105% rated voltage would see 126 volts on the wall socket. However, as I go down the circuit toward the load, I've got overhead line 
uh, segments that have drop. I've got cables that have drop. Um, so what's going to happen as they go toward the load, that voltage is going to go from 105% to some lower percentage. And what I need to make sure of is across all my overhead and my cables, that voltage doesn't drop too low, right? So normally, given that that customer at the meter has to see at least 114, usually what utilities do is they set up, I guess what I would call a voltage drop budget. And on the primary side for their overhead and their cables, what they would do is they, they would make sure this voltage doesn't drop lower than 97.5%, which is 117 on a 120 volt base. And what this then allows is this is going to allow for a certain drop across the transformer and also the secondary of that transformer. And this is why one of the homeworks I had you put a secondary wire in there just so you can see how much drop we can get from that, all right? So what you would normally budget for would be if I wanna make sure the voltage doesn't drop below 114, I would allow on my primary circuit, I would allow like a 7.5% drop. And then on my transformer and my secondary service, I would, I would, I would allow for a 2.5% drop. And if I started coming out of the transformer 5% over nominal, then what I make sure of is I make sure that this does not go below 95%, all right? And normally as planners, we're, we're more focused on the primary voltage drop. It's up to usually another department to make sure we got the right size uh, customer transformer in there and the right service drop. But normally what we're looking at is we're making sure that this doesn't go below this amount on the primary voltage side. Now, given there's uncertainty in the load data, 117 would be the absolute low point, right? and there's uncertainty in our data. So normally what utility planners will do is they'll make this target a little bit higher, maybe 118 or 119, just to account for uncertainty there might be in the load models or in the line drops. And so when you're gonna like do a study for somebody, they may say, well, we want 118 for our criteria, 119 for our criteria, just to make sure I don't go below that 117 volts. Uh, one other thing that I just want to mention in here is that when we consider the customer wiring, that's not anything the utility is responsible for. The customer needs to make sure that if they take service at 95%, that it's not going to drop below 90%, which would correspond to this 110 volts. Uh, for lighting, this is really supposed to be a little bit higher than that. Um, because if you're talking about like incandescent lighting that we, we used to have, and that would have been sensitive to the voltage magnitude. Um, but, but anyway, this isn't anything that we're concerned about. That's gonna be the, the customer problem, making sure they have the right type of uh, wiring in their facilities. So in the United States, there are voltage standards. There are typical voltages that would get used by various types of utilities. And the voltage it gets used is a lot of times a function of history, like back 100 years ago when the utility got started, you know, what voltages they start with. Uh, a lot of times it depends on the density of the load. So if you have very high density load, you might want to have a higher voltage um, than say if you had like lower densities. It would maybe depend on what's the length of the the distribution circuits, you know, is it three miles, is it 10 miles, whatever. And so this shows all the different range A um, nominal voltages and ranges for these voltages. And you can see as far as nominal system voltage, and I'm just going to talk about the line values. You could have 4.16 kV, uh, 8.32 is not very common, 12 is not too common. 12.47 is very common, 13.2 is common, 13.8 is common. Uh, you have 20.78, 20 
22.86 is what they use in this particular area around NC State campus. Uh, 34.5 is another sort of common voltage. These are all common voltages. Now, what this table shows is it shows for these nominal system voltages that are very common, then what are the service voltage requirements in terms of line values and also line to neutral values. So you can see these voltages are all over the place. And so if you were gonna tell me on a distribution circuit that the, um, the line voltage was say like 11,000, I couldn't really tell you necessarily if that was too high or too low because there's all sorts of different voltage possibilities. And it's, it's hard for me to convert in my head, you know, whether I'm 5% over or 5% under any given nominal voltage. However, if you were gonna then convert these values on to 120 volt base, I could tell you right away that 120 volt base, if this voltage is coming in at say like 116, it's too low, regardless of what this actual nominal system voltage is, which is why most distribution planners look at this type of data, look at these results on 120 volt base. Okay, so again, we usually have our analysis set up where we basically see what the customer would see at their wall socket, you know, if they were going to plug into that section of the system. Now, different states have different standards um, as far as what voltages are required, but they normally line up with the ANSI standards. All right, so you'll you'll see different states and if you go to their web pages for the regulatory commission, they'll have rules and regulations about their standard voltages. And so for the state of North Carolina, you could go to this PDF here and it has all the, the regulations concerning voltage. And so basically, you know, they'll have like a certain rule, uh, standard voltage, blah, blah, blah. Um, you know, these are the following nominal voltages that should be supported in this state. And then what they'll do in here is they'll list these various sort of values. Now, what we're showing in here is that we're showing, you know, values for both three wire and four wire systems. Most of the time, these are gonna be four wire. And you can see like in North Carolina that for customers, you would have 208 line at the, at the secondary side. You can have 240 uh, line to line for three phase service. You can have 480. So these are the three values that we've typically talked about in some of our lectures. And then these are the primary side values. And you can see you've got 4.16 kV, you got 12.47 you got 22.86. These are the same sets of values that are in the ANSI standards. And so usually the states typically have their standards line up with the, with the national standards. What you'll also see is you'll see the range allowed. And so for residential use, this needs to stay within plus or minus um, 5%. The voltage variation can't be within plus or minus 5% of nominal. However, if you were a commercial user or industrial user, these state regulations seem to say that, that you can actually go outside the plus minus 5%, you can actually go plus minus 10%. The reality though is that if you have like a industrial load and if that voltage deviates too much and that causes say um, manufacturing problems with the with the product quality, then they're going to complain the utility the utility is probably going to do something to keep the voltage deviation in a, in a smaller range. And so technically you could go plus or minus 10%, but given that there might be some issues with power quality, which I'll talk about in a later lecture, um, probably a lot of utilities wouldn't want to do this. The other thing too is usually residential customers are kind of intermixed with commercial customers and it's kind of hard to have two different levels of voltage quality surface. Another thing you'll see in a lot of these standards is some restrictions related to motor size. And so you can see in this case, like if you're on a residential service, then basically you have to make sure that um, if you have three phase 
motors. Um, then I shouldn't say residential, but the lower classes of service that you shouldn't have more than 20 horsepower, three phase and single phase motors in excess of five horsepower. And the reason for this is that if you have a motor, when you start a motor up, it draws a large amount of current to start the motor up. And so if you had a lot of your residential customers, which had big motors for whatever reason, uh, when those motors start up, when they draw a large amount of current, they're going to cause a lot of voltage drop, which causes your, your lights to flicker. And so usually what they would do in here is they would um, have some restrictions in here as far as, you know, the sizes of um, motors you can have and, you know, not um, cause problems with, with voltage power quality. So what we'll do next is we're going to start talking about, well, how do I keep these voltages within range? If, if I have to keep the voltage at my customer meter between plus and minus 5%, how do I do that? Because the loads are changing on the, on the circuit constantly, right? And so this shows a, a diagram of a, of a distribution system coming out of the substation. What we're assuming in this case is we have multiple feeders coming out. In this particular case, we've got one voltage regulator, and this could be an, a you know, special type of auto transform, which I'll talk about in just a little bit. And so what it's gonna do, it's gonna regulate the voltage at this bus that's common to all the different feeders. And as I mentioned before, we usually run this high, maybe four to 5%, maybe not quite 4%, maybe some slightly smaller value than that. But usually we run that high coming out of the substation to account for the, for the voltage drop. And then as the voltage would start high, this kind of shows what the profile could look like. If the voltage starts high up here, and this is it like 105%, um, like if it starts high, then what would happen is we move down the feeder, it would drop down at a certain point, if we need to get that voltage back up within range again, what we do is we put in a device called a line voltage regulator. And what that's going to do, it's going to boost this voltage up. And then when we get past this point, it's going to start dropping down again. So one thing I could do in circuits is I could put these voltage regulators in there. Now, the, the problem with these voltage regulators is they're very, very expensive. And so I just don't want to put these all over the place. Not only are they expensive, but there's a lot of maintenance associated with them. And so I'd kind of like to limit the use of this. Other things I could do would be to put in capacitor banks, which is a subject of future lecture, a lot less expensive than putting in these line voltage regulators. Um, but, but anyway, uh, what you're going to have for voltage control, first of all, you set the voltage at the top of the feeder. Um, as needed, what you could do is you can have these line voltage regulators downstream. And then something else we'll see as well is by having capacitor banks from the circuit, which may be fixed or they could be switched, I can actually change reactive power flow. And I can get regulation of voltage that way as well. But the voltage regulator, as far as the flexibility, gives me the, I guess, the most flexible way of actually controlling voltage even though it's one of the more expensive devices I could put out in the feeder. So again, how's this gonna look? And uh, let's suppose I don't have any downstream line voltage regulator, I just have regulation at the top of the feeder. Well, what's gonna happen, let's suppose we set this uh, first point on the top of the circuit to as maybe as high as we can get it. Say we're gonna set the control to 126 then what's that voltage actually going to look like as they move down the feeder? Well, if I just looked at this somewhat idealistically, this voltage profile would be on this dotted line or dashed line here. All right. As I move down the circuit, um, I'm going to have a load on the circuit. I'm going to get voltage drop across my overhead lines and cables. And as I go down the circuit, it's going to drop, 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 drop. All right. Um, eventually, when I get to the customer, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to tap on to the, the primary. We're going to have some voltage drop across the transformer. We're going to have some voltage drop across the secondary surface. Don't 
think this is necessarily the scale right here. And then this is what the customer toward the end of the circuit is actually going to see is they're actually going to see this particular voltage here. So it's a combination of drop that we have on the primary side and drop we have on the secondary side. It's a summation of those two. The other thing you have to keep in mind is that given that the, the load's going to be constantly changing all the time and I only got so many fixed uh, set point positions on this line regulator, I can't continuously adjust it to a really super fine resolution. It, when I adjust the voltage, it's going to change in, in a discrete step. And so what's actually going to happen is instead of it being along this dash line, it's going to be between an upper bound and a lower bound where this range between the upper bound and the lower bound is what's referred to as the, the bandwidth, right? And I try to keep this bandwidth narrow so I have good voltage regulation as load changes. However, I don't want that so narrow that I'm exercising my tap changing mechanism too much. It puts too much wear and tear on it. So usually what you'll do is you'll set this up in a way where maybe the bandwidth will be about two volts. And so you're, if you have a set point of say like 124, the actual voltage is between 125 and 123. All right, so there's a little bit of uncertainty as far as what is this actual voltage, depending on the on the controller and the fact that we don't control exactly that we allow for a little bit of bandwidth in, in regulating the voltage. So I'll give you guys a spreadsheet which could you know, used to calculate this using K factors. And we're going to be kind of using this later on when we look at capacitor placement. But basically what this shows is it shows a little mock feeder. And you've got the ability of controlling the voltage at bus zero with the station voltage regulator. And then you have the ability of controlling the voltage right after bus number two. So we could maybe call this like bus two prime, something like that. And what we do in this particular scenario is we assume there is a certain voltage for the circuit. We assume that there's a line resistance in ohms per mile. This is a positive sequence impedance. We have a length of the total circuit. So I, I'm just assuming that I just take the length and divide through by six. I've got a net load KVA in the circuit and I could break this down. Maybe I'm assuming a uniform distribution in this case. Uh, you have a load power factor, and then you have a set point for voltage at the top of the feeder. Now, I'm not setting the voltage on the, the line regulator. I'm just assuming it's not there initially. And what you can see in this case is if you do go through these calculations in the spreadsheet, that you can see if the voltage starts up at 126 volts, that's 105% or 1.05 per unit. But as you go down the circuit, it kind of drops off. So the, the initial drop is kind of high because this first segment here has all the load. But then as you go down the feeder, you have less load, less load, less load. And each uh, following section has less voltage drop associated with it. So you kind of get this particular shape for voltage drop. And this is very, very typical on primary distribution circuits where the first section coming out of the station has a lot of drop. And then as you get further and further away, the amount of drop per section decreases. And so you have this particular shape characteristics. And what we're, we'd be interested in is what's this low voltage? And again, you, you could have a criteria like 118 or whatever, 119, but you usually would want to make sure that voltage doesn't drop too low. And if that voltage drops too low, then I need to fix it somehow. And we'll see later on how a line voltage regulator placed here can fix it. So as far as improvements, and we'll get into this on the semester project, um, how would I fix this if the voltage is too low? Well, the first thing you could do is you could play around a little bit with the set point for that voltage at the top of the feeder. You might make it a little bit higher, you might make it a little bit lower. So you can play around with the set point. 
or what you could do if you have existing line regulators out here, you can play around with those set points as well. So sometimes you can get a little bit higher voltage out of them and not cause any problems with, with low power quality. The other thing you could do as well is make sure the load is balanced. So why is that so important? Well, if you have a circuit and I've got phase A, phase B, and the phase C current, if that loading on here is imbalanced, where's that imbalanced current going? Well, that imbalanced current, part of it's going back through the neutral wire and part of that's going back through earth. And whenever you've got current flowing back through the neutral and, and the earth, then that's gonna give you additional voltage drop. So it's very, very important to keep our load balanced if we wanna minimize voltage drop. Once you look at these easy things, then you kind of get into some things where you have to start spending some money. And so adding capacitor banks um, is a pretty good investment, trying to correct the power factor to close to unity. The other thing you could do is you could put some monitoring at the end of the circuit, have a meter here. And what that allows you to do is not have to model the uncertainty. If you know exactly what that voltage is, you could usually um, get by with um, maybe not having to spend more money on control, but instead just do more monitoring and, and operate closer to the limits. Because again, you could go all the way down to 117, but you normally don't do it because you don't know what's going on out there. But if you took measurements, you could usually operate a little closer to the limits. Uh, the other thing you could do is you can add switch capacitors, which are a little bit more expensive than fixed. You could add these line voltage regulators on the feeder. You can add them directly at the customer, but that's going to start costing a lot more money. And you could do some things with loading where maybe if the circuit's too loaded down, you can move the load over to other feeders. The things that would require much more investment would be if I would start going into the circuit and make these cables larger. Because if I make the cable larger, what that does, that reduces the impedance and reduces the voltage drop. But going back into a utility circuit and reconductoring and, and upping the conductor size or going from say like one phase to two phase or from two phase to three phase is very, very, very expensive, right? And so that's something you'd usually want to reserve uh, if you had no other options. The other thing you could do, and we'll see this later on, is you could, you could maybe take advantage of having distributed generation. The, the problem would be is that, is this going to be something you could dispatch or is that going to be something that's um, intermittent because it's say like PV based and actually it could cause a problem even to get worse in, in some instances. So anyway, we'll be talking about these different sort of things this semester and you'll actually get some experience in trying to apply some of these fixes in the second part of the project. So how are we going to do these voltage drop calculations? If we were going to do this by hand, maybe put this into a spreadsheet or, or use MATLAB for this. What we would, what we're going to do in here is we're going to use this K factor analysis. We're going to linearize around nominal voltage, assume that we have a constant current model. We're going to get voltage drops based on that. So again, as you recall, this percent voltage drop is going to be the line distance times the K factor times the load on a given section. And if, for example, I could keep my substation at 1.05 per unit or 105%. Um, let me write this in terms of a percentage here. I usually just go back and forth. If I can keep my primary voltage drop under 7.5%, what this means that if I have the 105% subtract off the 7.5%, that it's not going to get below 97.5%, which corresponds to 117 volts. All right. So if I can keep my primary voltage drop net below 7.5%, then I've kind of done my job as a distribution planner. And this is what you'd have up to the customer distribution transfer. Uh, then somebody has other, some other department's problem to make sure there's not too much drop across the transformers.
the, the nice thing about also this K factor analysis is I can do superposition with it. And so if I have like three line segments from zero to one to one to two to two to three, then I can just simply take the voltage drop across each one, sum them up. And what this does is this gives me a next a net voltage drop. And so you'll I'll be kind of using this quite a bit. And the reason I like it is if you need to do something fast, this would be a lot more convenient than just simply trying to run a power flow study. So remember before we talked about the formula for this, this is the K factor in um, brackets here. And what's really important when you look at this is you see what's the relationship between voltage drop, what R and X are, what the power factor is, and also to some extent, um, what's going on here with, with uh, power and distance, right? And uh, again, if we have what we call a spot load or all the loads just simply at the end of the feeder, then S is just simply the line length. If we have a situation where we have uniformly distributed load and say like um, the load's actually broken down into small incremental segments along the length of the feeder, then when we're modeling this, basically we can kind of model this as if half the load were on the source side and half the load were on the, uh, the load side. We'll get into some examples of that later. But there's four cases I just, you guys just have to be aware of when you're looking at this. First of all, what happens if we have, for the most part, resistive load? Resi resistive load means that we're going to have a really high power factor. You know, power factor is going to be close to one, right? And so if this is going to be the case, if the power factor is going to be close to one, what this means is that this term right here is going to dominate. For high power factor, the thing that impacts voltage drop is the interaction between the load current and the line resistance, all right? Now, let's suppose that the um, power factor drops off. Let me see if I can erase some of this real quick on here. Kind of unclutter it a little bit. So what happens if the power factor drops down? Well, that means that this cosine theta drops, sine theta gets higher, and for low power situations, then it's going to be the interaction with the line reactance is going to be important, right? So if you again, if you have high power factor situations, it's the resistance that gives you more of the voltage drop. If you have low power situations, it's going to be the reactance that gives you more of the voltage drop. Now, what about if we had real power injection on the circuit? Let's suppose we had distributed generation. What does that mean? Well, if we had a situation where we have um, injection, then basically instead of having a voltage drop due to real current, if the current's flowing in the opposite direction, basically we get we start getting a negative voltage drop. Okay. So pushing power into the grid, say from a diesel generator, from a PV site, is actually going to boost the voltage. It's actually going to have the, the voltage drop being negative. Similarly, if I have a situation where I have a capacitor bank, capacitor bank is basically going to be um, drawing negative bars. All right, It's actually like it's injecting reactive power going back in the opposite direction. So similarly to having real power injection, if I have a situation where I have um, a capacitor bank, what the, what the capacitor bank is a situation where this sine theta term right here goes negative. And again, this is going to give me a negative voltage drop or a voltage boost, right? So what this means is that if, if I have a situation where I have voltage drop due to the load, I can compensate if I don't have a line voltage regulator, I can, I can also compensate by injecting power in through distributed generation 
or use a capacitor bank to inject to inject bars or in other words consume negative q and we'll see this over and over again in this class but you have you have to know besides using line regulators and what are some options for for adjusting voltage in the circuit and say we'll see this in examples later on so anyway um we'll talk about in the, in the next segment about how we specifically can do this voltage regulation you know what are the pieces of equipment that we can um, use to enable this functionality.